Welcome to Transformed by Grace, an in-depth Bible study of God's Word presented by the Berean Bible Society. Join us each time on this station as Pastor Kevin brings the transforming message of God's grace revealed through the Holy Scriptures. Speaking of race car drivers who have been killed in crashes at the Indianapolis 500, Indy car driver Scott Goodyear once said, you don't go look at where it happened. You don't watch the films of it on television. You don't deal with it. You pretend it never happened. And the Speedway operation itself encourages this approach. As soon as the track closes, the day of a fatal accident, a crew heads out to paint over the spot where the car hit the wall. And through the years, a driver has never been pronounced dead at the racetrack. And a trip to the Indianapolis Motor Speedway Racing Museum, located inside the 2.5 mile oval, has no memorial to the 40 drivers who have lost their lives there. Nowhere is there even a mention of it. Many go through their lives like this, not dealing with death or the thought of their inevitable death. They block it out of their minds and try to pretend it won't happen, but we can't escape the reality of death. It is a power against each of us is helpless. But Christ stated that he is the resurrection and the life. And by Christ raising people from the dead and raising from the dead himself, it shows that he is the one we must look to to deal with the subject of death in our lives. And the more we learn about our Savior, the more hope, comfort, and strength we find concerning death. Luke 7, 11 to 12 reads, And it came to pass the day after that he went into a city called Nain, and many of his disciples went with him and much people. Now when he came to the gate of the city, behold, there was a dead man carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and much people of the city was with her. In verses 1 to 10, we learn about the Lord healing a centurion's servant. The very next day, Christ journeyed from Capernaum into the Jezreel Valley to the village of Nain. Nain was about 20 miles from Capernaum and just six miles from Nazareth, where our Lord had lived and was raised. 20 miles was a long journey for one day, thus they would have likely arrived late in the day. Nain was a tiny village, nowhere else mentioned in Scripture. The name Nain means pleasant or beautiful. The village was situated against a mountain slope called Little Hermon in the Jezreel Plain. On this particular day, Nain's pleasantness and beauty was overshadowed by the darkness and gloom of death. And yet when Christ arrived, something beautiful happened on that day in this small town. The Lord traveled to Nain accompanied by a large crowd. Verse 11 states, And many of his disciples went with him, and much people. As Christ and this crowd approached Nain, verse 12 states, that he came nigh to the gate of the city. This gate was probably a decorative stone entryway to pass through as one entered the village. As Christ and his followers were on their way into Nain, they met a funeral procession on their way out of Nain. Verse 12 says, Behold, there was a dead man carried out. And verse 12 further tells us that much people of the city were in that procession as well. So there's these two very different contrasting crowds here. The crowd with the Lord was undoubtedly, undoubtedly upbeat, joyful, jubilant. But the crowd heading out of town in the opposite direction had the opposite frame of, of mind as they were sorrowful and solemn. The Lord was heading for the village while the mourners were heading for the cemetery. And a procession of life and hope met a procession of death and grief. 
At the front of one was a man who had been defeated by death. At the front of the other was one who would defeat death. Luke vividly presents this clash of total opposites here. Death meets life, sorrow meets hope, and one is shown to have power and authority over the other. The procession of people going out of Nain could be seen going out of any city or town in the world at any time. This is a scene that we can identify with, perhaps being the chief mourners, losing someone very close to you, and we've all been the ones in the crowd, being present as a support, having known the one who has died, being there because you care for the mourners. The one who had died was a man, according to verse 12, and according to verse 14, we learn that it was a young man. We are not told how he died or what caused his death, it could have been an accident, or it could have been a result of a, of a disease. But his death reminds us how people of all ages die every day. And just being young doesn't guarantee anything as far as death is concerned. And when parents are burying a child, the natural order of things that we expect at funerals is turned around. And of all the deaths, it is the hardest to bear. Donald Miller wrote this, In this story, death is seen at its worst. It had struck a young person, claiming its prey long before he had lived out a normal span of years. Death could conceivably be a mercy in old age, but here death had struck a particularly vicious blow, taking the young and only son of a widow. The burial custom of the Jews called for the family to wrap the body of their loved one in strips of lim linen with aromatic spices mixed in throughout the wraps. Jewish, Jewish custom also was that they typically buried their dead by the end of the same day. In Acts 5, when Ananias was struck down and died for lying to the Holy Spirit, Acts 5, 6 says, And the young men arose, wound them up, carried them out, and buried them. So Christ and his followers probably arrived at the city gate late on the actual day that the young man had died. After wrapping the body, friends of the deceased would place the body on a buyer, as you see in verse 14. A buyer was just a a plank of wood, an open stretcher, or a lattice frame supported by horizontal poles. The body on the buyer was carried to a family's burial cave in a procession with friends and family, and was then often place, placed in a cave on a rock shelf carved into the wall of the cave. Today, there are thousands of rock-cut tombs scattered over the land of Palestine, which recalls these burial practices of time past. Luke includes an important detail in verse 12 that conveys the desperation of the situation. The deceased man was the only son of his mother and she was a widow. This mother was bearing a young son and it was her only son. Both of these facts together make this a horrible tragedy and cause for deep grief. And this would be tragic enough for any woman, but Luke makes a point of telling us that this wasn't the only grief that she had experienced. She had lost her young and only son, and she was a widow. She had lost both her son and her husband to death. The mother had already buried her husband, and now she was burying her young son, and was left all alone. Widowhood without children in that time was a thing to be feared. She was alone in a society that did not have any special provisions or resources for the care of, of widows. The death of her son and husband had left this widow defenseless in a cruel world. She faced an uncertain future, and unless kind friends or other family members stepped in to help, she would have been left to fend for herself, and she faced a life of poverty. 
like the widow who gave her two mites in the temple, the scripture defines her that she was a certain poor widow. But there is a clue here to the kind of woman and person this mother was because at this funeral procession, verse 12 says, much people of the city was with her. And that day it was not uncommon for rich people to hire mourners for a funeral of a loved one. But this widow was not rich. She couldn't afford to hire people to show up for her son's funeral and burial, but a large crowd shows up anyway. All these people came out of care and concern for this dear and heartbroken woman. They came because she mattered to them. They wanted to be there for her and to support her. And often the most effective ministry that we can have for those who are grieving occurs by just being there like this crowd of people was for this widow. Luke 7, 13 reads, And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said unto her, Weep not. Meeting at the gate of Nain, verse 13 says, And when the Lord saw her, he saw her outward tears and grief and pain, but more than that, he saw her and knew all the hurt and pain that she was experiencing in her heart. As Christ looked upon her, her he saw her devastation. She was grief-stricken, having been robbed of one she loved so deeply. This widow knows nothing of Christ. Her world is limited in this moment to her darkened sphere of grief. And when the Lord saw the widow in her great sorrow, he had compassion on her. One can see pain and suffering in others, but not feel compassion for them. But this was not the case with our Savior. He did not just intellectually process the widow's loss and pain. He felt it deep within his inner being. He was moved from the depths of his heart by her tears. Christ felt her pain. He felt the pain that sin and death brought into this world, and his heart went out to her. Standing in the presence of suffering, our Savior was moved with compassion. And Christ was, and he continues to be, moved by the pain, hurts, and sorrow of people. If we are ever tempted to think that God doesn't know or God doesn't care what we are going through or feeling when we grieve at the loss of a loved one. We need to remember a verse like this in this account. Our Lord is touched with the feeling of our infirmities, Hebrews 4.15 4, says, and He helps and He comforts us out of the depths of His kindness and grace. Man was not made to die. Death is an alien intruder into God's perfect creation. When God made everything, he declared it very good. Death came in later as the result of sin, the sin of Adam. When sin came in, death came in. And all that is wrong in this world is because of sin. J.C. Ryle wrote this, The world around us is full of sorrow. Sickness and pain and infirmity and poverty and labor and trouble abound on every side. From one end of the world to the other, the history of families is full of lamentation and weeping and mourning and woe. And from where does it all come? Sin is the fountain and root to which all must be traced. There would neither have been tears nor cares, nor illness, nor deaths, nor funerals in the earth, if there had been no sin. We must bear this state of things patiently. We cannot alter it. We may thank God that there is a remedy in the gospel and that this life is not all. But in the meantime, let us lay the blame at the right door. Let us lay the blame on sin. God's answer to sin and death is His Son, Jesus Christ. And Christ willingly came into this world to pay the price for sin. 
and to defeat sin and death by his cross and resurrection that we might have life and hope. And here you find God's son confronting death. And what will he say in the face of death? Will he say, you deserve this? And all mankind deserves it because of sin and because of turning from me. No. When the Lord saw this mourning woman, he had compassion on her and said unto her, weep not. And that is an unusual command for a mourner. Don't cry. But he did so because he knew that the widow had no reason to cry with his life and power being in the presence of death. And that reminds us that Christ is the answer to death. Through him we have hope and life, and by him tears will be taken away. Luke 7, 14 to 17 reads, And he came and touched the bier, and they that bare him stood still. And he said, Young man, I say unto thee, Arise. And he that was dead sat up and began to speak. And he delivered him to his mother. And there came a fear on all, and they glorified God, saying that a great prophet has risen up among us, and that God hath visited his people. And this rumor of him went forth throughout all Judea and throughout all the region round about. All the initiative for this miracle was taken by the Lord. It was not in response to faith or, or even a request for help. It was solely in response to grief and human need. Christ was prompted solely by his own compassion and the Father's will. And that's just like how Christ came into this world. Like he saw this widow and her suffering and need, he saw each and every one of us in our great need, and in response to it, prompted solely by his love and the Father's will, he came to the world to deliver us from sin and death. Out of his compassion, the Lord stepped past the grieving mother to approach the body of the young man. Christ then touched the buyer to halt the funeral procession, and the pallbearers stood still. And then with no ceremony, Christ spoke to the dead man as if he were alive and simply said, Young man, I say unto thee, Arise. And as soon as those words left the Lord's mouth, the young man sat up. And just like that, the funeral was over. The young man's body had been lying on an open stretcher, not in a closed coffin, so that enabled him to sit up. The Lord spoke to him, and when the young man sat up, then he started talking. And this guy must have been naturally talkative, because when he rose from the dead, the first thing he does was just to start talking away. The old expression, dead men tell no tales, did not apply on this occasion. He told a lot of tales. We are not told what he said, but it was probably interesting. But imagine the reaction of the pallbearers, who probably had trouble not dropping the stretcher when he sat up, and then everyone else. But then most of all, imagine his mother. And in a touching act of love and tenderness, Christ presented that young man to his mother. That widow had to have stood there in shock as Christ presented the son back to her. She never even dreamed of this, of asking Christ to raise her son from the dead. She never even thought this was possible. But here he was, alive and well, talking up a storm. And I imagine that she grabbed her son, held him tight with tears of joy, now flooded with comfort. And that's what Christ does. He turns tears of grief and the tears of joy. The leader of the group going into Nain was and is the Lord of life. To the mother in the funeral that day at Nain and to a dying world, Christ has brought life, joy, and hope. The message from the Lord is the same today as it was 2,000 years ago. 
Weep not. Don't cry. See my power over death and believe in me. The scene reminds me of what will happen when the Lord returns at the rapture and we are reunited with our loved ones who have gone to glory. He will raise the bodies of those who have died in Christ simply by His Word. And at that day, He will deliver us to our loved ones and He will deliver us to them. And forever, we shall live together in His glorious presence. The story does not end, however, with this one skirmish with death recorded in Luke chapter 7. When Christ brought the widow's son back to life, he gave this widow a temporary fix to the problem of death. And in all likelihood, Christ brought this man back to life and he outlived his mom. But he was still going to die all over again. But Christ did not come into the world just to give a temporary fix for death. He came into the world to abolish our enemy of death, to defeat death for all time, and to permanently end death's power. 2 Timothy 1, 9 and 10 says, Who hath saved us, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. This was the first of three times Christ raised people from the dead as he raised the widow's son, Jairus' daughter, and Lazarus. Every time Christ came near someone who died, they refused to stay dead. Christ never gave a funeral sermon. No one died or stayed dead in his immediate presence. D.L. Moody used to say, Jesus spoiled every funeral that he went to. And that's because he is the resurrection and the life. And we read here of a funeral procession that did not end at the grave. In verses 16 and 17, we read how there came a fear on all. All the crowd with Christ and all the crowd from the funeral procession was seized by sudden fear, awe, and wonder at this miracle. It was a good fear, a reverential fear in the sense that they had seen the powerful hand of God at work that day. And we should still have a sense of awe and wonder at this miracle. As we contemplate Christ's power over, over death, but even the power of his compassionate love. It had been 800 years since Israel had seen someone raised from the dead, the last case being done by Elisha the prophet. Nobody there had seen anything like this. The crowd gave praise to God and glorified God for the miracle, and they likely remembered the days of Elijah and Elisha when the prophets raised people from the dead. Thus, they thought that Christ must be a great prophet like them. They were saying that a great prophet is risen up among us. Christ was a prophet and much more. And they were gripped by fear because the miracle was evidence that God hath visited his people. It's not that they understood or believed that Christ himself was God, but that that miracle gave evidence that God was working in their midst in Israel. It did not take long for the report of this miracle to spread. The report of a miracle and of a great prophet and God visiting Israel spread throughout the surrounding region and its towns and villages and even miles away south into Judea. If they had newscasts, newspapers, radio, and social media, this event, would have been the headline story in Israel. This miracle was clear evidence that Christ was the Messiah of Israel. In the verses following this, when John the Baptist had a moment of doubt whether Jesus was the Messiah or whether they should look for another, the Lord sent back word to him, Go your way and tell John what things ye have seen and heard, how that the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised. 
the raising of the dead was a clear, powerful sign to Israel that Jesus Christ was her Messiah. And this miracle was a powerful demonstration that Jesus Christ was and is her promised Messiah. One day a man came face to face with death. He was standing on the corner and death walked by. Death looked a little surprised, but he kept on going. Terrified, the man went and asked an old wise man what he should do. I just saw death a few seconds ago. He looked shocked to see me. What should I do? The old man said, if I were you, I'd run to the next city in a hurry. So the man got up and ran as fast as he could to the next city. As soon as he crossed the city line, he ran into death. Confused, he said, I just ran into you yesterday and left the city to get away from you. Death said, yeah, I was surprised to see you yesterday too, especially since I'm scheduled to meet you today right here. There's nowhere to run. There's no place to hide. Death will find us wherever we are one day. This miracle reminds us of our mortality. It also shouts to us of Christ's power over death in the grave. Death and God's remedy came together at the gateway at Nain, and we see which one has more power. And it shows who we must turn to for hope. Death is not the end for those who know Christ as their personal Savior. Because of Christ, like this miracle took place at a gate, death is only a gateway, an entrance into life, the transfer into Christ's presence. Joseph Bailey said about death, death is the great adventure beside which moon landings and space trips pale into insignificance. For the believer with death, we know that there's hope in Christ. We know we're deeply loved by God who sent his son to save us and give us hope beyond the grave in heaven. And we know that should we die before the rapture, our spirit will immediately be present with the Lord and our bodies will be raised one day by Christ at the rapture and we will be given immortal, incorruptible bodies and mortality will be swallowed up by life. Thank you again for tuning in to Transformed by Grace. We appreciate your prayer support and the financial gifts. The purpose and mission of the Berean Bible Society is to help you understand the whole counsel of the Word of God. For more information, visit our website at www.bereanbiblesociety.org or give us a call at 262-255-4750. Or if you prefer, write us at the Berean Bible Society, P.O. Box 756, Germantown, Wisconsin, 53022. Now until next time, may you be transformed by God's grace.